Medical Association, I would like to uh, welcome you to the first monthly clinical meeting for 2022. Uh, we have a case presentation, a review lecture, MCQs, and then a discussion with all the faculty. So to start off, may I invite Dr. Chanaka Ratnayaka, Registrar in Pediatrics, uh, Lady Ridgeway Hospital, Colombo, to make the case presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, my dear consultants and my dear colleagues, and uh, the viewers uh, whom are joining with us uh, through the online. And uh, thank you for giving us this great opportunity, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association. So I will be discussing about, we'll be discussing about uh, case. Uh, so our topic is complicated dengue in children at the midst of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, moving on to the case, uh, Shaili is a six-year-old boy, previously healthy one, presented on 12th of January with a history of uh, high fever, high-grade fever, 103 Fahrenheit, with vomiting and abdominal pain, right hypochondriac pain, for three days duration. He presented with the uh, dengue NS1 antigen report, which was positive on day two of illness. But on examination, he was hemodynamically stable, and we monitored the child with dengue febrile phase monitoring with the febrile phase chart and daily full blood count with bedside ultrasound scan leaky. And uh, during the ward stay, uh, we detected that child was having pericholecystic fluid and uh, fluid in the hepatorenal pouch. So we managed as dengue hemorrhagic fever with critical phase monitoring and with appropriate fluid management. So critical phase was started at 9 a.m. 13 chen, and it was uh, 48 hours was ended at 9 a.m. 15 chen. And uh, for the critical phase, we used a maintenance by 5% deficit, 100% fluid quota was used without needing any fluid boluses or uh, dextran boluses or blood transfusion. So critical phase was uh, went uh, well without any complications. The problem was uh, even after completing the critical phase, child was having persistently high fever spikes with severe abdominal pain, and there was no contact with of COVID-19. So this is a fever chart. Uh, if you can see, uh, this was a critical phase from 13 to 15, and 103 degree fever spikes were there. Even after completing the uh, critical phase, child was having high fever, and uh, we went. Examination-wise, uh, anthropometry-wise, uh, child was average to be a child. The weight was 19.2 between 25th to 50th centile. And BMI was 13.3 with median to minus 3. And child was ill-looking. And uh, he, there was no pallor, uh, no, no tictoric, no lymphadenopathy. Hydration was good. But there was red lip and red eyes. Uh, without there was no, It was non-parallel red eye. Uh, and the cardiovascular wise, uh, pulse rate was around 100, beat 70, with good volume, no murmurs. Capillary refill time was good. And uh, blood pressure was 100 by 60 between 50th and 90th centile. Respiratory wise, uh, it was around 20. And bilateral vesicular breathing was there with only a slight air into reduction in right side lower zone. If we attributed the, with the dull percussion node, which attributed to the DHF causing the leak, uh, pleural effusion. And there was no added sounds. So abdominal examination, there was tender hepatomegaly about two centimeters from the right side of the costal margin, and there was no other palpable masses, so no free fluid. CNS examination was normal. And uh, so our thought process was differential diagnosis size. Is it uh, dengue DHF complicated with sepsis? Because a uh, child was on a uh, indwelling catheter for two days during the critical phase. And uh, with the effusion, we thought of low respiratory infection as well. And uh, second differential diagnosis was secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis due to dengue infection. And the third differential was multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children because uh, these few months we saw uh, few, many cases with, few cases with dengue fever on top of that COVID-19 and uh, DHF with COVID-19 and some cases with the DHF is missing, uh, coexisting both conditions. So uh, this was uh, taken from the Sri Lanka uh, SLCP guidelines on Peter College guidelines on MISI, uh, 2020 July edition. And uh, in that, 
she he was having fever more than 3 days and he was six years and uh, there was no uh, for the clinical wise mucocutaneous wise there was a red eye and red lips and gastrointestinal wise there was severe abdominal pain so we went ahead with the tier 1 workup full blood count alt ac albumins blood urea creatinine electrolytes crp esr and covid antigen on admission was negative and we did a covid antibody and uh, to rule out the sepsis we did the blood cultures urine cultures ufr and chest x ray so the our second dif- uh, second differential was uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis according to the american society of hematology guidelines 2004 revised criteria we thought of hl hl hlh so uh, molec- one is molecular diagnosis consists with hlh which we couldn't do here and the other was uh, five criteria out of eight, uh, following eight it was fever splenomegaly cytopenia hemoglobin less than 9 g per deciliter or platelet less than 100 or neutrophil less than 1000 with the dhf recovering dhf child was anyway having low platelet and neutrophils it was confusing uh, to diagnose with that so hypertri- so we did the other investigation hypertriglyceridemia hypofibronogenemia and fibronogen yes and uh, other one was hemophagocytes in the bone marrow uh, low or absent nk cell activity ferritin and soluble cd25 level so uh, with the available uh, investigation availability of the investigation we went ahead with the investigation to look for HLH and MISI. So these are the investigation. As you can see, on admission, WBC was around, total, absolute count was 2,400, neutrophil 1,800, and platelet was 107,000. And CRB was 21 on admission. And uh, raised AST ALT was there, 227 AST, interstitial interfilita, and ALT was 75. So uh, we repeat the investigation on 15, suspecting uh, HLH and MISI. WBC was... pricing 3340 neutrophil 1130 and platelet was 73000 it was pricing trend which dropped up to 56000 during the critical phase and crp was not elevated that much elevated to 16 if it is miss c we expected much more rise than that and is esr was 3 so but we didn't have any uh, prior esr counts with the esr uh, it was not telling with the miss c but more favors the hlh and the ast alt was persistently elevated 404 ast with alt of 149 the fibrinogen was 2.16 which is normal 2 to 4 uh, g per liter was the normal range it was 2.16 in the hlh uh, we expected it, it to be less than 1.5 to call it hypofibrinogenemia in miss c we expect uh, hyperfibrinogenemia but uh, it was normal range ldh was high usual normal range is around up to 280 units per liter but this was 2005 units per liter and triglycerides were 2.1 we expect uh, in uh, both uh, mc and hlh is to be more than 265 mg per deciliter that means about 3 millimoles per liter uh, but this was fairly in the normal range and uh, the serum ferritin was 12440 the normal range is 7 to 140 it was very markedly elevated and the other investigation wise sepsis wise blood cultures were negative ufr no pus cells no red cells urine culture was no growth chest x ray no inflammatory shadows and creatinine blood urea erythrocytes were normal with albumin of 35 and coagulation profile was normal and uh, we got the antibody covid 19 antibody uh, results which was non reactive negative so uh, considering the most possibility we considered was hlh uh, depend on the result but uh, hlh criteria 2004 american society of uh, hematologist criteria uh, we had three criteria from out of eight which was fever cytopenia and hyperferritinemia so we wanted another one to diagnose it uh, so we went ahead with bone marrow aspiration and biopsy and uh, while awaiting the results we calculated the h score hlh h score which was 200 and probability of hlh is was 80 to 88% with the h score so with the strong suspicion strong probability we started iv methylprednisolone short course of iv prednisolone for iv uh, steroids for 3 days 
and uh, this was the response following the, the uh, colored yellow colored uh, sorry green colored uh, arrow shows the response following the steroid it was dramatic response uh, clinically child was child became totally back to normal within 24 hours of treatment and the followed the uh, following day we got the bone marrow aspiration result there was increased histocytic activities with evidence of hemophagocytosis and uh, child with the steroid tailing off with the oral steroids for about 10 days child completely got recovered and uh, regarding the hlh score h score uh, our consultant dr kosala karna ratna will be talking about in the review lecture so uh, this was a case of secondary hlh due to dengue infection so for the diagnosis of this hlh h score was helpful with the bone marrow uh, biopsy and uh, the other main differential during the pandemic so we thought of missy so uh, that is a case that we so so thank you uh, dr kosala karunaratna will be commencing his review lecture regarding the case and the topic thank you yes uh, we are indeed privileged to have uh, dr kosala karunaratna very experienced and a very famous pediatrician from the lady ridgeway hospital uh, uh, to speak today over to you kosala uh thank you very much uh, ishan i think uh, thank you very much for your kind words and i must first thank uh, uh, slma for giving uh, this opportunity on behalf of the college of pediatricians uh so i think uh, this is a very important topic uh, for the moment uh dengue emerging as a problem amidst uh, corona yeah so so uh regarding the incidence now uh, this slide shows uh, compared to 2020 in 2021 at lrh we saw a very much increase in number of children coming with dengue is almost like a 10 time in times increase in cases uh this was in november and december but when we compared the, the previous years of before the pandemic the the number of cases has not gone up but only compared to 2020 the inference we got was the schools being closed in 2020 and the families in, engaged in cleaning activity more at home but the situation is very different around the world dengue during the pandemic is becoming a problem around the world cases increased in many countries during the pandemic in brazil there is a 19% increase in cases thailand reported increased number of cases as well ecuador reported one of the largest dengue outbreaks during the pandemic and mind you these are the countries where corona pandemics are ravaging so dengue was a covid is a diagnostic challenge actually when you take the symptoms fever myalgia skin rash and fatigue with the evidence of lab inflammation like lymphopenia thrombocytopenia liver enzymes and sometimes inflammatory markers are not very helpful in differentiating both the febrile phase and further to the confusion is the false positive serology that you see false positive dengue igm is seen in patients with covid that is due to cross reacting antibodies that is the uh, corona virus causing cross reacting antibodies igm against uh, dengue this was first reported in singapore in march 2020 in dengue endemic areas diagnostic and public health concerns were rising due to this fact and uh, in sri lanka we do a rapid antigen test so but in countries where they do uh, re rely on antibody or antibody testing as a rapid test this causes confusion and also for in regards to diagnosis also it causes confusion because at the latter part of the febrile phase sometimes some clinicians do antibodies and you see igm going up so fever with positive dengue serology 
they are the the patient should be screened for covid as well so because of this uh, cross reacting antibody and the other concern about cross reacting antibody uh, that igm whether it causes hyperimmunity or uh, immune enhancement in dengue but studies show that uh, the it's not the igm that causes immune enhancement is the igg but igm also can cause so are we heading for trouble so about dengue i am not going to talk about the facts because all of us have actually grown up with dengue decades of treating it and seeing the facts we know and the clinical features are very familiar febrile phase critical phase and the recovery phase and uh, in 2009 who uh, changed its uh, definition uh, uh, for, uh, and classified dengue as severe dengue and non severe dengue and this was a good move because the previous classifications were ba based on hemorrhages and the who saw since only in 2009 and in they categorized dengue the febrile uh, face with or without warning signs and severe dengue as classified as severe plasma leakage, severe hemorrhages, and severe organ impairment. Febrile phase. So, during the febrile phase of dengue, there can be confusion whether it's some other virus, uh, is it due to some other virus or any other reason where the, the, the fever is due to that. The characteristic about the Fever in dengue is sudden onset, high rise of temperature. In fact, it causes febrile conversions in infants and small children who are predisposed. So, showing that uh, sudden rise in core temperature is the rule in dengue. Usually not seen in corona in children. Uh, in corona in children, they can have uh, about 50% of cases could be afebrile. And this is uh, another forgotten fact that saddleback fever pattern in dengue and and it's supposed it's described as classical in dengue where fever goes this is not the differences of fever in shock the fever can go down after a couple of days and uh, remain in the baseline for one or two days then come back again not seen in most of the other fevers maybe a useful point again the symptoms of dengue this is who the the leaflet all these symptoms can happen in any of the viruses we, uh, that are circulating around the country at the moment. So there is no way you can differentiate by these uh, rashes, uh, pain behind the eye. Now they say the headaches uh, are common in the Omicron variant, stomach pains, diarrhea, all seen in all other viruses. So there is no way we can differentiate by these symptoms. So to add to the confusion, we had a flood of missy cases to LRH coming uh, somewhere around July, the peaks really started, and these are the these are a bit of a graph we do uh, where uh, from July to September 2021 there were nearly 80 odd cases we saw, and it shows uh, that most of the children are over six years of age the, who got Missy. So because Missy gave lots of signs confusing with dengue. So what you see here are what, two of the rashes that you see in dengue. There are usually what we see is classically three rashes. So two are seen here. One of the rashes, the, the common one you see is the maculopapular rash, truncal. Truncal maculopapular rash can spread, usually starts from the trunk and spreads to the head and neck. As opposed to like in measles, it's the other way around, measles, rubella, and rosiola, those viruses causes facial rash spreading to the trunk, maculopapular. So, fairly was characteristic uh, before Missy came. So, we, it was a truncal rash. Now, this is the truncal rash you see. And the other rash you see here is the uh, petechial rash. Although dengue was described a hemorrhagic disease, petechial rashes are rare in dengue, especially in children. And most of the observational studies show that Petechial rashes are uh, petechial rashes are seen usually in dengue fever rather than dengue hemorrhagic, and and when you see in dengue hemorrhagic, it may be in the recovery phase or later on. So it's not very common. So this is a child. These are the children 
these pictures were taken uh, in my ward and the face is not covered because I got the permission from the parents uh, to show some signs. Now you can see the frontal rash in this child, very much like dengue. But the difference is you can see the lips being red, eyes red, and the eyelid, eyelids are swollen and red. That's something you don't commonly see in dengue, but still, even in dengue, you can see all these signs. So strawberry tongue, the KD variant of Missy uh, had most of them had a strawberry tongue, red eyes. So these are child who came with Miss C having red dyes. Again, in dengue, you can get red dyes easily, like in our child who was in the ward, uh, Dr. Chanaka presented, had red dyes. Especially when dengue has co-infection with adenoviruses, they can have red nasty eyes like, like as even Kawasaki. But only thing is now limbal sparing. That's the, you can see there is limbal sparing like in Kawasaki and Miss C. Uh, this is the famous rash, third rash of dengue, the recovery rash. Islands of white in a sea of red, where the, the islands of white come in the recovery, but now if you appreciate the sea of red, that comes in the acute stage. So almost a scarlet in form rash, which can be confusing. So the islands of white, when they are there, it's easy, but in the acute stage, it's, it's a red rash. So what you can he see here is a child with Miss C who came with the toxic shock-like uh, presentation who had the scarlet uniform rash. You can see it's almost uh, almost like the red rash or uh, scarlet uniform rash in dengue. So, I mean, we had a lot of diagnostic uh, problems uh, when the, these cases were coming and pouring in. And so the case definitions uh, were taken from uh, the CDC and WHO for Miss C, under 21 years, few for more than three days, and any two of these systems being involved. What we saw mainly at uh, the LRH uh, was mainly skin mucous membrane with gastrointestinal involvement, where they had scarlet, uh, they had Kawasaki-like uh, presentation in the skin and mucous membranes with diarrhea, severe abdominal pains. And when they came with the cardiac complication, it was a little bit easier to uh, diagnose Miss C. Uh, then once the evidence of inflammation came, it was a little, very much clear it's Miss C because it, all the inflammatory markers can go up like ESR, CRP, uh, and uh, D-dimers are very high. It's not usually seen in dengue. And uh, also, if the heart is involved, drop I and, and our tier one and two, tier two investigation gave us a lot of information. But mind you, it takes time. Mm -hmm. So, just as the child comes, uh, we need more evidence to, I mean, to differentiate. And, uh, and most of them had RT PCR and RAT negative because these, the, the antibodies were the ones they, that was positive and it took some time to come. And also with, with the raging epidemic going on, antibodies was common among children. So we went for the teeters. Teeters of over 10 was helpful. Then another helpful test, a forgotten test came to our help. This also <coughs> can be useful. Febrile face with warning signs, uh, can be uh, also confusing in a, in a case of dengue child. We, uh, can be misdiagnosed as, uh, I mean, Missy can come just exactly like these signs. Severe abdominal pains, persistent vomiting, and change in sensorium for some of the uh, warning signs described in uh, dengue. And with these signs, it, no way that you can say whether it was Missy or Dengue. Mucosal bleeds, again, not that common, but if they came with coffee crown vomitus and melina, it was more suggestive of dengue. Hepatomegaly was suggestive of dengue, uh, if it was. So these uh, uh, warning signs were not that helpful. Thrombocytopenia, very commonly seen in C, and the increasing hematocrit sometimes uh, can be not appreciated. So the critical phase. Again, in the critical phase, the way we, we suspect the critical phase is fever defervescence. Mind you, the fever defervescence in the critical phase 
is uh, as opposed to a lot of people think what they think of it doesn't come to the baseline uh, the fever defervescence is from very high fever to about 37.5 to 38 centigrade so that can be missed so and also fever defervescence sometimes doesn't occur and they can start leaking without defervescence so the some of the severe cases of dengue uh, dengue in shock was confused with the uh, uh, missy in shock so as the who definition goes non severe disease or severe disease is non severe disease with or without warning signs severe disease is dengue shock syndrome severe hemorrhages severe organ involvement dengue shock syndrome can be either compensatory shock or, or it can be profound shock if profound shock is allowed to go on it will lead to severe hemorrhages and severe organ involvement but you can have severe hemorrhages uh, following in messages even without uh, patient going into dengue hemorrhagic stage even in the dengue fever stage they can have severe hemorrhages so there is no way we can say non severe disease to severe disease whether there are associations no definite association some studies show that prolonged fever thrombocytopenia may be associated with non severe to severe disease and the child dr chanaka described was a non severe disease although in the critical phase the child was not in shock and they didn't have any hemorrhages so it was a non severe disease so dengue shock was a missy shock sometimes it's a dilemma in the etu because these children come collapsed so missy shock is a cardiogenic and a vasoplegic shock so because uh, of these facts it's more of a warm shock but some of them if the cardiogenic shock predominates they come can there are a few children who are in cold shock as well so features of cardiogenic shock like uh, third heart sound and pulmonary edema leading to shortness of breath was useful but again in a, in a uh, in a now if it is a profound shock the child will be acidotic so again very difficult but one of the key features were narrow pulse pressure so in 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 uh, dengue shock syndrome narrow pulse pressure is the feature and uh, usually in uh, in the uh, missy shock the, there will be hypotension but if the child comes in uh, profound shock is again difficult they both will be hypotensive so the tier 2 investigations of chanaka was talking about was helpful for us and uh, when the reports came we could diagnose but mind you in the etu you had to take a decision in the child in, in shock uh in dengue you had to give two normal saline boluses followed by dextran and in, in missy shock we also gave a 10 ml per kg bolus because of the vasoplegia and followed by mostly by inotropes so two conditions were different and detrimental if you don't diagnose so sometimes focus that is point of care ultrasound scan was helpful so because in dengue you could see uh ivc is collapsibility indicating dengue and sometimes a crude assessment of left ventricular function also can be done by focus so these difficulties we face i hope we don't have to face it in this epidemic that is seems to be emerging and there are other forms of severe disease as well as the case was discussed secondary hlh so i won't go much about the theory about hlh but hlh is a cytokine storm syndrome where uh, the 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 macrophages have gone heavy and producing lot of cytokines causing lot of problems even in organ damage and we see that uh, the, we see a form of uh, cytokine storm in in genetically susceptible children which is called primary hlh and secondary hlh is usually due to various infections as well as the mass or macrophag activating syndrome is a type of secondary hlh you see in sogia and also sometimes in sle so the secondary hlh you follow viruses can be often due to co infections i'll come to that later so diagnostic criteria again i'm not going to detail but this uh, the, the 2004 
uh, HLH diagnostic criteria is not really helpful in, if it follows dengue. As you can see, uh, it gives only a, sm a small weightage to ferritin. Ferritin is one of the most important investigations we rely in HLH. So, and also the fact that, uh, I mean, you can't do any of these genetic tests, so those are not available for us. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a clinical situation, we have to take a decision fast as like the case that was discussed. So what about the H score? H score is very useful in situations like dengue and other viruses. Because as you can see, uh, the ferritin gets a very high score. If it is over 6,000, it gets 50. 2,000, 6,000, 35 and less than 2,000 not. So mind you, so that, that is very clinically uh, useful score used by most of the uh, uh, centers around the world. And we should be using this to decide what to do in a clinical scenario. Five, so HLA, for HLH diagnosis, five of eight HLH criteria should be fulfilled. And in the case we described, even with the ferritin of 12,000, we got only three criteria. And even with the positive bone marrow, we got four criteria. So, so we have still not diagnosed, diagnosed HLH and the child would have gone into organ failure. So that is the ultimate outcome of HLH. If you sit on it, the child is going to organ failure, which we have seen in mass following like in Sojia, they rapidly go into organ failure if you don't act fast. Same can happen, the viral secondary HLH as well. So when you take H-score probability, uh, probability of 70% or more is enough for you to diagnose uh, uh, HLH, uh, HLH. So this is the probability of HLH uh, scores. So, so if you, like in our patient, we had a uh, probability. So it, it's based on the probability of you having HLH so as a percentage. So if it's over 70, you can take a clinical decision. So it's score without ferritin is not diagnostic. With ferritin and the, like in our patient who had 200, it was 80 to 88% possible probable to have HLH. And with the bone marrow, it, it will be almost 100%. So hyperferritinemia is associated with secondary HLH and dengue. And also in severe COVID infections, so especially in adults, when they come with the severe type of COVID infections like severe ARDS or septicemia or, or, the, or, or the other complications of uh, COVID, they can have high, high ferritin. Also, mind you, in dengue, uncomplicated, in, 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 if it's a severe dengue, you can have a high ferritin without HLA, somewhere even up to about 1,000. So I am coming to the last part of my presentation, which is the most important and the one that I want to give a message. So dengue and COVID-19 co-infections. Co-infections associated with more severity. So they, the studies are showing associated with more complications. And if there are, is dengue with corona virus co-infections, septic shock, ARDS and MODS are more, uh, they can have more severe disease and high risk of death as well. And what is important in our, our practice, in pediatric practice is miss C. So now this is a uh, study I uh, took from uh, uh, done at in Mang Bangladesh. It's a severe dengue with miss C, a co-infection case series. It was published in uh, November, 2021. In Bangladesh, where currently they are facing a double burden of severe dengue and COVID. All children presented with shock and plasma leakage, mind you, all children. So like in our child, that our child didn't actually present with shock. So, so if somebody is arguing, okay, is the shock due to Miss C? So they are, all these cases had plasma leakage. So these, these children with the, the co-infections had plasma leakage and also features of Miss C, mucocutaneous and GIT in all was common in all these children. And, and all these children showed coronary involvement. So here, here is a situation, uh, dengue and 
uh, Missy causing a mixed out bag of uh, presentation. And, and, and the, the, the implication is now, now if you are treating this child, you have to treat the leaking stage and you have to treat the coronaries also. So, so if you are treating the coronaries, you have to give aspirin. So aspirin is uh, quite tricky in dengue. So, so, but all these children had received aspirin as well and they have all got through. And, and just to uh, give you a caution, I saw one child during our Miss C epidemic, uh, one child who had a similar presentation with severe dengue with Miss C. And that child also, we had to give steroids and aspirin as well. So the child got through the stage and was doing well. I saw the child recently as well. So dengue associated HLH. So it's more commonly seen in severe dengue, associated with zero type two. So both are probably not there in the patient you we described. So it was not a severe dengue, not associated with zero type two, but we didn't know zero type three style, but the strain that is supposed to be going around is zero type three. But that's just an assumption. So my point is, this could have been a mixed infection. So word of caution. So there have been case reports, concurrent COVID-19 and dengue with HLH as well, to make things worse. Right, and the last slide is, uh, now this is a study we did. Uh, this was during 2018, the Southern epidemic of a severe SARS-like epidemic where they found two viruses, one after the other. That is, it was an adenovirus superimposed by H1N1. So most of, I did the case series, most of them went into HLH and its score was the one we used and they all got well. And with multiple antibiotics and antivirals, they were deteriorating. They did well with the steroids. Right, in summary, Dengue incidence is on the rise during the pandemic. So it is around the world. Still, our data doesn't show a rise, but it's worrying now. It may rise. Uh, more severe dengue disease types are recognized, and it may be a result of co-infections. So in the future, so the mosquito has got larger in this picture because the future, both viruses are going to be endemic, and dengue is already endemic. And after the Omicron, there is a feeling that it might become endemic. And we'll be seeing more of these cases and you have to be aware. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Kosala, for an excellent presentation. I just noticed that we have uh, 69 participants online. See, not 69 lakhs, but 69 participants online. Right. Um, right. So the next presentation is the MCQs by Dr. KGM Aberatna, Registrar in Pediatrics, Lady Ridgeway Hospital for Children. Uh, good afternoon, dear consultants and my dear colleagues. Now we are moving on to the MCQ sessions of uh, today's uh, lecture, Complicated Dengue in Children uh, Amidst of COVID-19 Pandemic. So I'll be discussing uh, six MCQs with uh, two picture questions. Uh, these are uh, best of five questions. So I will be uh, reading the questions and I'll be giving two minutes for the ans answers. And you can answer it in uh, these two minutes and after that we can have a discussion. So the first question is a seven-year-old boy presented with high fever for five days and loose tools for three days with severe abdominal pain. Other than minor upper respiratory tract infection one month ago, his past history was unremarkable. On examination, he had red lips and bilateral red eye, generalized erythematous sash. Uh, his blood pressure is 70 over 40. Other system examination was normal. Ultrasound scan abdomen showed thin rim of fluid in hepatorenal pouch with ESR of 240, uh, CRP of 240 with ESR 70 and D-dime of 2100. 
So the question is, what is the next best investigation to confirm the diagnosis? So the five answers are dengue antibodies, COVID-19 antibodies, blood culture, leptospirosis serology, and typhus serology. So you can give me the answers in the next two minutes. Can we get answers from this online audience? In that case, I'll discuss the answer for this question. Yeah. Uh, this patient is a seven-year-old boy presented with high fever for five days with loose tools for three days with severe abdominal pain. So he has got uh, upper respiratory tract infection one month ago and on examination, he had mucocutaneous features of uh, red lips, bilateral red eyes and generalized erythematous rash. So uh, his blood pressure was uh, low, uh, that is hypotension was there. The tricky point here was a uh, scan showed thin rim of fluid in the hepatorenal pouch, but all the inflammatory markers were high here, uh, so showing evidence of some coagulopathy here with D-dimers of 2,100. So here the, we have, uh, uh, we are in the pandemic of, of COVID-19 and we are facing a uh, post-COVID sequelae sequel as well. So the, uh, the, here the uh, answer is the COVID-19 antibodies. The tricky point, though it, he showed some uh, thin rim of fluid in the hepatorenal pouch, which is again we can see in the MIS-C. So uh, the, 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 here the diagnosis is uh, multi-system inflammatory uh, uh, syndrome in children, uh, COVID-19 infection. So uh, that's right, and also the if you do the dengue antibodies, IgM may be falsely positive. Yeah. That's the other problem. Yes. And also about the thin rim. We saw in majority of our cases of MIS-C, we saw a thin rim because serocyte is very common in MIS-C. Yes. So that's not going to differentiate. Yes. But with the, this given uh, high inflammatory markers here, high CRC yeah, with that, high that, ESR. That, 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 and that's right. So that, yes. that point is also there. She has given high inflammatory markers. So I mean, the, out of the best of five, it has to be. The, yeah, the there's a history of upper respiratory tract infection one month ago, possible COVID infection here. So we took it as missy, the diagnosis and the uh, appropriate answer is COVID-19 antibodies. Would you like to come in? Uh, so that, uh, I think uh, I will invite the uh, poster to come to the podium. Uh, uh, the question and answer discussion, Kosala uh, yeah. can continue. So you also agree to? Yes, yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, because it's the... Uh, it's correct because uh, COVID-19 antibodies, uh, because uh, this is uh, the best response. It's a different type of a question. I think all of you have the experience in MB part one. And uh, usually all the questions are uh, correct, but you have to get the best response. Uh, no, I was just wondering because COVID-19 is so rampant and probably many of us have already got infected. Uh, could you have like a, I mean, positive COVID-19 antibodies, whereas these symptoms are not really due to COVID. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, uh, again, I can answer that. Uh, now, COVID antibodies can be done in teeters, IgG. Right. High teeters are very suggestive of a uh, missing infection because what we went by in, during this uh, MIS-C epidemic right. was more than 10 zero, uh, teeters. Right. That was very useful. Right. And that they think can that we like uh, what is the best uh, way the stem should be COVID nineteen antibody teachers? Yes, I suppose so. That is, yeah. I think so. Yes. Yeah. And moving on to the next question, uh, this is again ten year old girl admitted with fever for four days with headache, arthralgia, and abdominal pain. She was afebrile since the day of admission. Refill time was less than two seconds with pulse rate 90. Blood pressure was 100 over 65. She had tender hepatomegaly of 5 centimeters and scan showed pericolicystic fluid, fluid in the hepatorenal pouch with minimal pleural effusion in the right side. So child was started managing as dengue hemorrhagic fever with critical phase monitoring and urinary catheter was inside for hourly urine output monitoring. Despite having stable vital parameters and good urine output, child remains ill with spiking fever on day nine of illness. On examination, liver size was six centimeters with splenomegaly of two centimeters and again had high CRP with 240. Here ESR was 10 with cytopenias. So the question is, what is the most likely diagnosis at this point? 
first one dengue shock syndrome sepsis secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis acute lymphoblastic leukemia and viral hepatitis yes uh, the online audience uh, is giving the answer three at least two people have given the answer three that is the third one secondary hemophagocytosis yeah uh, that is the correct answer as we discussed in our case presentation and in our search, uh, review lecture this is a typical uh, presentation of hlh secondary hlh following uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever so the correct answer is secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis uh, my question is uh, how common uh, to have uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis uh, coexistent with uh, or the secondary to dengue yeah it's not common but uh, there have been so many series uh, uh, where they showed the uh, secondary hlh following dengue and and again it follows a more severe attack of dengue severe attack with shock and the other severity features rather than a uh, less severe case like in our our child that is why i am i we were wondering whether this is a co infection so we might see more cases now for the last uh, two weeks i have seen two hlh another child who came with a, uh, to the ward with a pulmonary abscess was treated with iv antibiotics and this child uh, had uh, to start with had a very high esr and crp due to the pulmonary abscess and also the child had a very high platelet count and it started dropping the platelet count from somewhere around 600000 started dropping to about 150000 and uh, child's fever was going on to see that the child's dengue antigen came positive and bone marrow showed uh, hemophagocytosis so this child again responded very fast to methylprednisolone so two cases within two weeks and i saw more cases as well during the 2017 epidemic where there, it was due to type 2 there were a lot of cases i think nalin presented a case series where they saw a lot of cases in the icu uh, for the benefit of the listeners uh, this question goes to kosala uh, what my time want to ask is uh, what at what point we should think about uh, this same model yeah so uh, regarding hlh uh, now if a child as uh, chanaka presented if a child after dengue is not getting better high fever is going on and also the bicytopenia is not going to be very helpful because anyway they will have bicytopenia but if you feel a spleen or the liver is getting large and child is ill looking and also if the esr is dropping now that's another feature seen in hlh now that was seen in this child now the child had a 10 esr now now those are indicators that the child might be going to hlh so then then do the h scoring and get a ferritin done pass rather than bone marrow is going to be a problem because they are anyway very thrombocytopenic bleeding risk hematologist is not going to be very happy in some children to do a bone marrow i think you were talking about a liver and the spleen we can in the dengue fam right we can see the liver enlargement yes and spleen is, is not a, usually not seen not, yes. usual. not usually it's like lymph nodes possible but yes. not usually yes. so the here the it tilts more towards a significant spleen yes if there is a significant spleen coming up it may be a challenge yes challenge and the crp 240 we don't see uh, yeah very high crp but it's a second with secondary infection possible possible that, that's the and other iv fluids yeah so that is the dilemma again now if you see uh, this a child like this it could be secondary infection as well so if you give steroids to a secondary infection you know the consequences and the ferritin cannot be so high yeah the ferritin is the key key, key thing because so it can so, go up but yes. not very high the child with the abscess i told you about ferritin was 30000 more than 5000 yeah so 5, so in this child now you know having abscess giving methylprednisolone oh, very tricky so moving on to the third question it's year old girl admitted with high fever abdominal pain and take five days infection on admission uh, she was ill looking a febrile had called peripheries with refill time more than 3 seconds Pulse rate was 150 with blood pressure of 66 over 
and uh, capillary PCV was 54%. Scan showed pericholecystic fluid, fluid in hepatorenal pouch, moderate ascites with tight side pleural effusion. So the child was given 20 ml per kg, that means two 10 ml per kg normal saline, normal saline boluses over two hours, followed by 10 ml per kg dextran bolus as well. Despite initial fluid resuscitation, child remains ill with low PCV and 43%, uh, PCV of 43%, and remain hypotensive with low urine output. So the question is, what could be the cause for this refractory shock? Uh, ongoing sepsis, acute liver failure, acute renal failure, or internal bleeding, or heart failure with pulmonary edema? Ah, yes. The answer given by the audience is number four. Yes, that is the correct answer here because ch this child came with a frank dengue shock uh, uh, on admission itself and child was given adequate fluid resuscitation despite that piece, uh, hematocrit, hematocrit drops, but child remains hypotensive. Uh, this, that is the point where we should suspect internal concealed bleeding if there's no overt bleeding. So here, we, uh, we expected the answer as internal bleeding here. I think uh, uh, Abdel correctly explained the turning point is uh, the drop in hematocrit and uh, the persistent blood pressure. Yeah. Yes, yes. And also the pulse pressure. You can see the pulse pressure is quite narrow. And, and uh, this shows that the, it's a uh, hypotensive, uh, pro, is it a profound shock? Yes, yeah. 66 so, hours. Yeah, so we do profound have shock can follow bleeding. I, I mean, the bleeding will follow a profound shock if it's allowed to go on. And it's very important to take a history of NSAIDs. They may go into bleeding even without profound shock or in, any shock. Uh, question to uh, Kosala. Kosala, in this case, uh, we give uh, two uh, two doses of, uh, I mean, uh, boluses, saline boluses, uh, and followed up with the strand. Yes. Uh, at what point we should uh, consider giving uh, blood? Uh, I think this child, yeah, I think, uh, I think your At next part time. of the question is that I think uh, she, uh, next follows uh, the, I think uh, I will uh, answer uh, your question. Uh, so I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this, what, is, what is the next immediate step of management? So the answer is repeat 10 ml per kg normal saline bolus, repeat 5 ml per kg dextran bolus, third one blood transfusion, four start liver failure regime, and sixth one is the uh, fifth one is the IV prusamide one milligram per kg bolus. Right, the answer coming up is three. Yes, that is blood transfusion. Yes, that is the correct answer. When we suspect that uh, internal concealed bleeding, we have to give a blood transfusion then and there. My question is, uh, blood transfusion is came at the fourth step. Uh, uh, sticking to the guide. Uh, Can we come bring it up a little early? Is possible. Yeah, if there's over bleeding, we can go for the blood transfusion yeah. early. But if uh, otherwise, we have other, other, other thing we have noticed uh, of bleeding is significant acidosis. Now, now I would I have clinically decided then given blood earlier in some children. If you go don't give blood in those children, they are going, not going to recover because now a child having shock and the compensated shock is they will have compensated uh, acidosis. But if you have decompensated acidosis as well, so and and with a P low pH with a low bicarbonate, and a child in shock, I think you have to think about uh, bleeding as well. So sometimes you have to take a decision beyond the guideline in situations like that. We have taken it, and and some deaths when we analyze, the question came up in LRH with the blood should have been given earlier. I think it's a very good question. So Atsurant asked. In those situations, sometimes you have to go beyond the guideline, go by acidosis, go clinically. Sometimes concealed bleeding is very difficult to judge. Because uh, more and more we talk about the guidelines, but I want to emphasize this, uh, we move to patient-specific guidelines, and then we talk about subspecialty. Now, we most of the country now move into uh, disease-specific specialties, where there is authority, he or she is doing only cystic fibrosis because of the, the depth knowledge and the outcomes are uh, very significant, especially tertiary care center usage. Yeah. Next, we are moving on to the uh, picture questions. 
uh, here we have given two slides so you can answer the question identify the abnormal cells in blood picture so this is a blood picture and what are the abnormal cells in this blood picture so i think here i have to give the answer uh, so you see here these large the online audience has not responded ah yes atypical lymphocytes one person says Yeah, that is the correct answer. Here we can see large lymphocytes with uh, is uh, in uh, protruding protruding in into the uh, in between the red cells. So this is the typical nature of uh, uh, atypical lymphocytes. Large lymphocytes with abundant and strongly basophilic cytoplasm. The cytoplasm tends to be indented by surrounding uh, red blood cells. So flowing cytoplasm. They call it the flowing cytoplasm. Flowing cytoplasm. Yeah. I think that is. Question to Abhiratna. Yes. Uh, why it is atypical? Uh, Not typical. Yeah, this. Uh, For the benefit of the list. Yeah. This uh, lymphocytes are typically large, with they have this abundant and strongly basophilic nature compared to uh, uh, the normal lymphocytes, and these are typically seen in uh, viral infections such as uh, Epstein Barr viral infections, cytomegaloviral infections, and even dengue. We can see this uh, uh, atypical lymphocytes if we do a blood picture. and uh, next slide is this is a bone marrow aspirate so identify the abnormal cells in the bone marrow uh, uh, yes uh, one person says hemophagocytes uh, hemo, uh, hemophagocytes another person has said hlh so the answer is we have shown here a hemophagocyte large hemophagocyte All the uh, erythrocytes, lymphocytes, and other hemophagic uh, precursors are within this uh, phagocyte. So it is hemophagocyte. Hemophagocyte. So abnormal cell is the hemophagocyte. If you have, you if you are asked what is the condition associated with these cell types, the answer is HLH. So the so specific answer is uh, hemophagocytes. Yes. So that's all. Is the underlying. Demand for you to understand the question. Identify the abnormal cell. HLS is the underlying, but cell is still there. So this is one thing. You, uh, yes, yes. When we ask questions Absolutely. in the long case, okay. and uh, Professor Ishan, expert in gastroenterology, because uh, uh, you deviate, uh, it makes us very tired. Yes. and one problem is when you ask for a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis people start with the word because they say because this 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 but whereas what is being asked is a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis right so it's important to answer the question yeah uh, so that's all for today uh, mcq and uh, picture uh, question session uh, thank you all of you one final question to pose sir why what is the incidence you see uh, coexistence of dengue and omicron or viruses the incidence wise you have any experience yeah, actually there are you know a lot of talk about it, uh, delta and omicron coexistence yeah the there is no figure as such but there are a lot of case uh, series the, the one i mentioned about missy with uh, coexistent covid causing a very severe disease together with coronary involvement now that is a bit of a problem then it's difficult to give aspirin as well uh, so 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 they 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 are they are having lot of case series and we have seen similar cases during the epidemic in at lrh so there will be more figures in the future uh, let's hope by we don't get the co infections going on and it looks seems to be a big problem if it comes up there is also one more audience question that child they are asking this blood transfusion what volume at what rate uh, we can give a uh, 5 ml per kg blood transfusion at once and depending on the response we can go ahead with the further blood transfusion and the fluid management first thing is to go ahead with the 5 ml per kg at uh, The, when when we diagnose the uh, this uh, bleeding in the dengue shock patient uh, i like to thank uh, all the speakers and it was a excellent uh, 
consists of excellent presentations and very interesting round of questions. And I'd like to thank the audience, all the numbers are less. We expect that during the year, if the pandemic get somewhat controlled, more numbers to participate because we can interact very li lively. And then the, I must thank the audience who joined uh, online. Uh, and uh, this is the first inaugural uh, meeting for the, this year uh, under the thematic session, a monthly clinical meeting in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. Uh, so the speakers were Dr. Chanaka Ratnayaka, Dr. KGM Abe Ratna, and Dr. Kosal Karunathna, who is a senior consultant, pediatrician from Lady Ridge Hospital. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you again. Uh, behalf of the SLMA, uh, we have a, a small uh, thing, the certificate, uh, and in appreciation of your uh, excellent lectures, would be given by uh, Professor Ishan D. Soisa, uh, who is a senior uh, consultant uh, uh, gastroenterology surgeon at the Department of uh, Surgery at uh, in the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. And I prefer him to give because uh, he's from a different discipline. It's a, a very significant uh, for him to award it. Thank you very much. So first of all, I call uh, Chanaka Ratnayaka to accept your uh, letter, the token of appreciation. Then uh, then uh, Dr. K.J. Mabe Ratna. Finally, Dr. Kosala Karunathna who is a consultant pediatrician as well as the vice president of Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you.